Hi, everyone. Welcome to this live Q&A today. My name is Panilla Gard, and I am the Program Marketing Manager at the Specialty Coffee Association. I'm very happy to welcome you to this session. Um, and with us, we have William Rissenpart from UC Davis Coffee Center. Um, so this uh, live Q&A is following the, uh, the latest research video presentation that we've created together with Bill. Um, and uh, it was really a tutorial on how coffee houses and, and any really coffee uh, businesses can stay safe uh, in these times. So we're very happy to have William with us to present um, some of this again uh, and also answer any questions you might have. So take it away, William. Thanks. No, thank you. And uh, thank you to everybody who uh, is joining us this morning. It's morning time for me. Um, and so, like Pranilla said, um, hopefully you've had a chance to watch this almost two hour long uh, series of uh, um, uh, YouTube uh, videos um, talking about coffee houses and, and COVID-19. And so my, my goal this morning is not to rehash everything uh, that was in that two hours. I'd like to just give a few, maybe 10 minutes or so of kind of an overview and an update. Um, I filmed those uh, videos in the first week of September. And now we're here in the middle of October and so much has uh, happened since then. Um, and so I'd like to go over that a little bit. Um, and then the majority of the time today, what I'd love to do is really take your guys' questions, take questions from the audience. And so that's um, what we'll spend most of our time on. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, and so here's our, our update. Okay, let's see if this works. All right, and so I'm presuming most of you watched this video. Um, if you didn't, I'm just gonna very briefly um, recap, very briefly recap. Um, so we had four parts. The first one uh, is why worry about airborne transmission? Okay. Um, and so as many of you are aware, there's been a lot of controversy about you know, what the modes of transmission are for COVID-19. The short summary of part one is it spreads through the air, period. Okay. So if you don't want to watch the movie I just, I, or the videos, I just saved you a bunch of time. There's lots and lots of indirect evidence that strongly supports the fact that there is airborne transmission. Part two uh, was all about how does the virus get into the air? And I think uh, a big theme for what I talked about there was how many people really just visualize airborne transmission based on what they see when you sneeze or you cough. And is represented in cartoons like this, where you have a woman and there's like this big scary looking cloud of red, huge red droplets coming out. And a key point that I really try to drive home in part two is that you don't need to cough or to sneeze to get virus into the air. What I'm doing right now, just talking, is actually emitting tons and uh, hundreds or thousands of micron scale aerosol particles that are way too small to see with the naked eye, but are big enough to carry the virus. And these particles, these aerosol particles, have been implicated in many outbreaks now for COVID-19. And then in uh, <clears throat> in part three, part three, the question is, you know, what controls the transmission probability? And <clears throat> Early on, the transmission probability, everybody's talking about washing hands. And then for many months, it moved on to this idea of like, oh, you need to have direct uh, spray, like somebody has to cough in your face, basically. And now, now there's increasing recognition and increasing official recognition that actually it's these micron scale aerosol particles also play a really important role in the transmission. And then part four, which I think many of the people on this call probably care the most about is how do I maximize safety in my cafe? And we'll come back to this here, and I'll have a few updates and clarifications uh, for how to do that. Okay, so um, first though, what's what's changed since September? So I filmed this stuff in the first week of September. It's been five weeks now. And <clears throat> without diving too deeply into politics, um, I'll just focus on the science here. But one really big thing that's happened is that the, the CDC, the American Center for Disease uh, Control and Prevention, finally, finally, um, um, uh, finally acknowledged that there is airborne transmission. They, for whatever reason, and there's a lot of discussion about political interference and things like that, but for whatever reason, they resisted for months um, acknowledging this uh, formally. And so here on the left, I'm showing a New York Times article, you know, uh, just uh, reporting this. There's a picture of a semi-famous individual down in the bottom left there, associated with a super spread, super spreader event. Uh, in the White House, so I'm sure you all heard about that. Um, in the top right, here's the CDC guidelines, and so they now officially acknowledge it. Basically, everything that I talked about in terms of aerosol transmission 
uh, in that uh, in the series of videos um, is now acknowledged by the CDC. Okay, so <clears throat> it's you know there's now uh, <laughs> official recognition. Uh, arguably several months too late, but it's there. Okay, and if you really want to dive deeper into the science, um, here is an article titled "Airborne Transmission of SARS-CoV-2." That's the virus that transmits COVID-19. Uh, published in the journal Science, which is you know arguably uh, the best uh, or the most prestigious scientific journal in the world, um, really driving this point home that yes, it's, there's there's no more you know debate that it's it is spread through the air. Okay, so <clears throat> given that we now have uh, this you know uh, confirmation that you know it's going through, how do we uh, go through there? How do we maximize safety in the cafe? And what I try to do in the videos, I really try to boil things down into four simple rules. And I'm, I'm showing them on the screen here again. Uh, the first one is pretty self-explanatory, masks are mandatory. You know, at least here in the States, there's all this you know controversy about masks and whatnot. There's no scientific controversy, it's all political. The scientific consensus is 100% on the side that masks not only protect you, but more importantly, protect other people. And so there shouldn't be any debate about that. You, if you're, a, if you're working in public, you need to be wearing a mask, you know, around both your mouth and your, and your nose, okay? Um, if you're managing a cafe, you should insist that your employees and your customers are wear that. Uh, the second uh, rule is increase your ventilation. And just qualitatively, I've had by far the most questions about that. I think people understand masks. People have a harder time with ventilation. It's not, you're not used to thinking about that. Same thing with air purifiers are fantastic, okay? Um, and so that, I strongly advocate the idea of using portable air filters in spaces where you don't have as much control as you'd like over the ventilation. And then finally, the fourth rule is limit your exposure, okay? Um, and so uh, how do you limit the amount of time you have customers inside, you know, waiting around lines or talking, things like that. Uh, and so let's briefly um, update some of these. And the very first one is um, increase your ventilation. And so I just wanna clarify a few key points. Um, and so in the video, I, I really highlighted um, some of the indirect evidence for aerosol uh, transmission. Uh, with a, a series of uh, media reports and, and scientific articles talking about how the you know, COVID-19 is spread via the air conditioning. Okay. Um, and so what we're trying to get at there is that like, yes, there are these very small micron scale aerosol particles. They're so small that they can be carried around by very weak air currents in the room. Air currents so weak that you wouldn't even register them. You wouldn't notice them. But if you were an aerosol particle, you would think they're like a tsunami. You get pulled along by them across the room. And so on the top, on the left here, I'm showing an image of this uh, kind of famous outbreak in Guangzhou, China. The up here on this wall over here, this is a ductless HVAC unit, a ductless air conditioner. And the blue uh, cloud looking thing here is not a cloud. That's actually their computational fluid dynamics modeling of the airflow. And you can see it's sucking in warm air and blowing out cool air. The key thing about ductless air conditioning is that it pulls in warm room air, chills it down, and immediately pumps it back out. So it is not providing fresh air. It's just taking the air that's already there, including potentially any aerosol particles that somebody talked or, or expirated out and is recirculating in the room. And so, and so you can see that. Here, the index case was the one painted purple. All the red ones are the ones who eventually got infected, some of whom were very far away, right? And they actually have, this, this report is great, they actually have video uh, records of the whole event. And so they know that the index case didn't actually directly talk to anybody. So there's very strong, indirect, but very strong evidence that it was spread by the air conditioning, okay? And there was also uh, um, this Starbucks outbreak um, a month ago or a month and a half ago, where they also, the health public health authorities there, directly, again, implicated the air conditioning system, okay? And so this, in many people's minds, you start hearing, oh my gosh, it's spread by the air conditioning. Does that mean, should I turn off the air conditioning? Okay, and I didn't really talk about it in the video, so let's talk about that here. Should we turn off the air conditioning if it's spreading it? Okay, and the short answer is no, 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 okay. The, do not turn off the air conditioning, that's not the message. The problem is the air conditioning. The problem is inadequate ventilation. And something that cools down the air does not necessarily provide ventilation, okay, and so, to really drive that home, here's a, a cross section of a, a building. Okay, we can imagine this is a cafe. Many cafes have up on, the, if you look up on the ceiling, you'll see the ductwork that supplies your 
uh, either cooled or heated air from uh, essential um, uh, air handling unit. So it might come in here, go through a vent, and then there's a return somewhere, okay? And so these central air systems usually, not always, but usually, they take some fraction of their air from outside, maybe 20% of the air is from outside and 80% is recycled. And they do that for energy savings. And so if you talk to your HVAC technician, you can get them to potentially increase the amount of outside air. What you're doing is you're increasing the amount of ventilation. And like I talked about in the video, you should definitely check the MERV ratings on for your filters on your central air handling unit. If you operate a, a business that doesn't have central air, and what do you have? You might have some, here's a picture of a ductless HVAC unit here on the wall. Here's a picture of a fan. These things might cool you down a bit. You know, the fan blows the air past you so you get a little, what's known as convective cooling. Like we already talked about, the ductless thing sucks in room air and blows it back out. Those recirculate the air. They do not provide ventilation. So that's the equation up on top here. Recirculation is not equal to ventilation. And so they do, all they do is they just mix the room air. And the analogy uh, that I think resonates with people that I used in the video is that like this ductless HVAC or the fan are kind of like if somebody pees in a bathtub and then you say, I'm going to clean it up by stirring it with my hand. All right. All you do is spread it around. That doesn't, that doesn't do anything. You're just recirculating the pee in the bathtub. If you want to get rid of the pee, what do you need to do? You need to drain it and you got to dump fresh water in. And that's, that's what either the supplier and the return air are doing, or if you open the windows or do something else, get natural ventilation. So if you only have a space that has ductless AC, okay, here's the message for you, right? Thermal comfort and humidity control are, are both very important. Okay, so I'm not nobody's advocating that you sit there sweltering in the heat or you know um, dying in the cold. Keep using your um, ductless HVAC unit, but definitely look for other ways to increase your ventilation. Okay, opening your windows, opening the doors. If you do have both ductless AC and some type of central uh, ventilation, then uh, or air handling, then use that. And like I talk about in the video, definitely consider investing in some portable air purifiers. So this unit right here is 99 bucks. It's got pretty negligible operating expenses and it does a good job of um, grabbing room air, sending it through a filter that filters out the air, the micron scale aerosol particles, cleans the air basically and pumps it back in. So it doesn't provide fresh air. It doesn't help, doesn't help with cooling, doesn't help with oxygen or removing carbon dioxide. All it does is get the particles, the things carrying the virus out of the air. Okay. And this is a reminder, you know, most people, I think in this community are not trained in HVAC technologies, right? So if you're managing a cafe, find a good HVAC technician, find somebody to assess your space, find out how many air changes per hour you actually have, find out what your MERV rating is, find out what you can do. Okay. okay. Um, and so we're almost at the end of this. The other thing was uh, really, um, I talked about limiting your exposure. And I thought I'd just show one example of um, good practices. Um, and so um, I'm showing here, this is uh, Phil's Cafe in Davis, California. And I think just to be clear, I think there are many, many cafes around the country and around the world that are doing good practices. I live in Davis, so I was able to go visit this one. I was impressed by how they're doing it. Um, and so what's nice about this, they happen to have a really good location. They have a corner location, okay? Um, and what do they do that was right? So they open both doors on both sides of the corner, okay? And so here you can see that they have a walkthrough and it goes through. They have both doors wide open. Lots and lots of natural ventilation. We can do that here in Davis with the weather right now. Um, so they're taking advantage of that. Simultaneously, they had the HVAC on full blast. So I walk in, I feel um, the air coming out of the air hand, out of the, I guess you can't really see it here, but out of the air uh, uh, ducts up there. Okay. In terms of limiting your exposure, the customer line to order, you know, for in-person orders is outside. So, you know, they got it roped off. There's a line out here. Only room for one person at a time at the point of sale inside. So there's no line, no congregation inside. So that, that's really good. Um, they have this uh, one-way path through the store. So like I think many places have, they've really ramped up their online orders. And so the online orders are just sitting here uh, waiting on this table, okay? People can just waltz in, look for their name, grab it, and walk out and be gone within 30 seconds. That limits their exposure, limits your employees' exposure. It's, it's beautiful, it's a great system, okay? And um, I was also happy to see uh, that all the employees there were wearing masks uh, properly. I, I go to a lot of places, they got the mask around their mouth, but their nose is totally exposed and you know, things like that. You know, it's it's not rocket science. People need to wear the mask properly. And so it was really good to see that. So these are examples of good uh, practices. Okay, so 
that was a pretty uh, brief um, update and uh, overview of and um, uh, amplification of some of the key points of the video. If you haven't watched the video, it's about an hour and 45 minutes total. I recommend you do it. Uh, I think it's got a lot of a good advice. And what's the point of all this? Why are we thinking about this? You know, it's from your perspective, you want to make sure that your, your businesses are safe. From my perspective, as a coffee scientist, I want to be uh, able to go back to the situation that I'm pointing here, where people are hanging out in cafes, you know, working on writing papers, having intellectual conversations, enjoying delicious coffee, you know, without worrying about masks and without worrying about infection. And so that's where I'm hopeful that we can get to uh, very soon. And so uh, before I forget, I want to thank the Specialty Coffee Association uh, for providing me this opportunity to talk a little bit about my research in airborne disease transmission and, and Pacific Food Barista Series for providing the funding for this. And with that, uh, I see that Peter uh, Giuliano hopped on the call. Um, and so now I'm just going to open up for questions and I uh, am very happy to take whatever you have to throw at me. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Bill. Um, yeah, I want to uh, thanks, Bill, for that that um, summary and for doing all this work. I mean, the um, you know, at the beginning of all this and Bill, you and I have been talking about this for a while now, you know, what what we realized at SCA when we were um, interacting with the community on the COVID issue, what it what it became clear what the community was telling us through our surveys and stuff is um, having having skills in order to increase the safety of the of your business for your customers and also for your staff is like a key discipline right now. So um, I, I just wanted to share with everyone on the call, you know, Bill and I were talking about this. I, I work with Bill a lot on coffee science. He's the he's the uh, the director of the UC Davis Coffee Center. And I think of him as a coffee scientist. It was a surprise to me that it turned out that he had all this expertise in um, in COVID. And and uh, and so that's well, that's a fortunate. Let, let, let me break. Let, nobody had expertise in COVID until January. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I that's had expertise true. in transport yeah. phenomena, understanding yeah. how particles move around. And that pertains to coffee. It pertains to, unfortunately, to viruses. Well, it turns out to be like a really, really key thing. So we're just appreciative of that. And then I, I also want to echo Bill's appreciation to Pacific Foods Barista Series. They've been dedicating a lot of their resources lately to giving um, coffee businesses tools that they need to cope with these times. And this is definitely one of them. And so, and so um, this is intended to be a tool for coffee businesses to use to, to um, survive these times, to reopen if they're closed, to change their businesses, to adapt and make it through the next um, period of time. So besides your question specifically about, about this work, we'd love to know how we can use this info, get this information um, uh, out in a better way. And I, I can even mention some other tools. Um, so anyway, we'd love to hear feedback on that um, from everyone. Uh, okay, so we've got a Bill. We've got a couple of questions already, and I've okay. got some of my own. So, um, but one is from uh, from Timothy, and this echoes um, one that I had. Um, he said, uh, "I'll read this literally." He says, "From the video, I wanted to ask how much impact having an open window helps with the air changes per hour." That's a great question, and it depends on a whole bunch of things. You know, uh, if it's very windy outside. As you can imagine, it's going to have a tremendous impact. If it's a very calm, still day outside, it's going to have much less impact. So it really depends on the outside conditions. It also depends on the inside conditions. So if you have nothing causing any air motion on purpose in, inside your cafe, no fans, no anything, then and it's a calm day outside, that's going to be minimal air flow. But even if it's a calm, not windy day outside, something you could very easily do is set up a you know $20 box fan, aim it at the window. And that's going to blow air out the window, and it'll pull in air from other places, other either other windows or around the door, cracks or somewhere, and that'll help uh, increase your air exchanges per hour. The one, the other thing that I would that's really difficult to measure, right? I mean, um, like, uh, it, you you might have some intuition about whether the air is moving or not. One one thing that I was struck by when I was looking at some of your illustrations is. Like in that famous restaurant in Wuhan, sort of a an air cell got set up, right? Like yep. a, a mm -hmm. part of the room that um, that was sort of recirculating its air. That could happen even with the windows uh, with the window with the windows open, right? Like a small part of the room might uh, be yeah. like might be protected yeah. from airflow or something like that. No, no, it's it it's tricky. That that particular one I didn't really talk about, but the reason why like there was that scary looking cloud just on the 
top part of the, or here I can go. Are you guys still seeing my screen? Can you see this? Yeah. Yeah, so let's go back to that picture. Um, so the reason there's this scary looking cloud up here, and the reason that it's not going kind of anywhere else is that there's a, this rest, this particular restaurant happened to have a whole bunch of HVAC units. They had four along the wall. So there's another cloud right here, or there would be if they had visualized it right here. And so because of that, they had things forcing, you know, kind of these uh, uh, recirculation cells next to each other. If they had turned these three off, if they had turned these three off, then there would be some component here that you might see this kind of wrapping around this way too, you know, so. And when they went through it, if you go, I recommend you go read this paper if you really want to get into the weeds. They went back after this outbreak, uh, um, and this guy, Hugo Lee, is a, a pretty famous scientist at University of Hong Kong. Um, and uh, they put set up mannequins. They put hot light bulbs in each mannequin to care, like to mimic the body heat coming off of a person. They put down plates on each table, again, with a little hot uh, light, light bulb. And so that you have the warm air rising in there. They had the HVAC going the same way. They had somebody stand there and open the door every two minutes, you know, to, um, and then what they did is they had some tracer gas in there and they measured the tracer gas calculation, um, uh, measured the tracer gas concentration. And from that, they were able to back out. This this particular restaurant, I, I forget the exact number, had about 0 0.7 air changes per hour, which is pathetic. It's, it's like really small a number, just not enough uh, ventilation. And so I, I mentioned all that to really drive home that like to really get a precise number, it, it's not, you know, under actual realistic conditions, it's you have to do things that I even talk about using tracer gases and things like that um, that are I think beyond the capability of people who don't do it for a living. But uh, the rules of thumb that I present absolutely true. I mean, like these guys right here, there's some exhaust ports right here, um, which were designed to increase the ventilation. On the day of the outbreak, they had them shut. Right. So the only the only ventilation provided in this whole restaurant was right here, this little red line right here. That's their bathroom exhaust duct you know, the bathroom fan over the toilet. So they had this whole restaurant. The only thing mechanically ventilating anything was the bathroom. So, and that's why it was very poorly ventilated. So I'm not, I think I answered your question there, Peter. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, and then Timothy had another question about, um, besides COVID, are there other um, airborne transmission um, uh, concerns that we should have? Absolutely. Um, and so I, you know, I just mentioned that nobody was studying COVID until 2020. I actually, my kind of funded research um, in influenza uh, predates my, uh, you know, diving deep into coffee. So I started thinking about influenza transmission uh, in 2012. It was my first paper, um, and so it uh, uh, influenza is very similar in some senses to coronavirus. They're both 100 nanometer, roughly spherical little, you know, viruses that are respiratory viral pathogens. Um, What's what's amazing to a lot of people right now is that even now, even though influenza has been around arguably for millennia, the ancient Greeks talked about a disease that was very similar to influenza that had a flu season. Even now in 2020, we still don't know exactly how influenza spreads. It's strongly believed that it spread via aerosols as well, via um, airborne transmission. But just like for COVID-19, there's no direct evidence. All the evidence has to be inferred indirectly um, from you know observational studies rather than random, you know, randomized clinical trials, which you can't do for transmission mechanisms. So yeah, so there's influenza. Um, there's a whole host, um, you know, it gets a little depressing reading, but there's a whole host of different diseases that are spread through there. Measles is one. Uh, a scary one that we fortunately don't have to worry about as much anymore is uh, smallpox, you know. So there's there's all these uh, diseases. I think the biggest concern right now is influenza. You might have seen reports in the media about people worrying about, oh my gosh, what's going to happen this winter during our flu season when we have both COVID-19 and influenza. You know, every year, uh, tens of thousands of people die from the flu um, in the United States. Um, so it's now on top of that, we're up, I figure we're up to now, like 240,000 people in the United States have already died from COVID this year. Uh, so that's, that number is just gonna keep going up. So yes, there are other diseases to worry about. From your point of view as a, as a cafe owner or operator or employee, all the, all the precautions I'm talking about here, pertain just as much to influenza as to COVID. So everything about increase your ventilation, you know, wear a mask, uh, limit your exposure, all that stuff. Um, it, 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 those are all kind of you know, physical interventions. They all uh, help protect against influenza as well. Yeah, yeah. So open windows and, and makeup air um, uh, are gonna, as you mentioned, become more challenging as the weather gets cold, particularly in the colder parts of the climate. 
Mm -hmm. So filtration becomes more of an issue. We have a question about filtration here. Is there a known MERV air filter rating and micron rating that we should look for in air filtration? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the gold, the, the best thing by far, which you can't really get for commercial air handling units, at least not regular ones, is you know HEPA filters. Um, those get rid of 99.9% .9 of all the micron scale particulates. For regular air handling units, uh, the, the acronym you need to know is MERV, uh, Minimum Efficiency Reporting Value. Um, but that's basically, the MERV rating is what you wanna look for. And um, a lot of places, you know, have like MERV four or five or six or whatever. Uh, ASHRAE, which is this organization, which, you know, talks about uh, air handling, um, HVAC stuff. Um, they recommended uh, that where possible, you increase to a minimum of uh, MERV 13. Um, and I don't have the numbers directly in front of me, but like the, basically the higher the number, the more the micron scale particles it pulls out um, with the slight trade-off that you have a more expensive filter and you have to do more regular maintenance. Um, and your air handling equipment, depending on how old it is, literally might not be able to push the air through the, the finer filter. So that's why you really need a um, some type of uh, HVAC assistance if you're not an expert already to assess your system. But MERV 13 or MERV 14, um, that's what I'd uh, recommend because that's what ASHRAE recommends. Great, thank you. So let's um, talk about congregation for a second. Your last slide, um, and I think you mentioned this, was a we showed a coffee, a scene that we're all familiar with, right? A coffee shop that has people sitting there, laptops open, studying, et cetera. I remember from the video that you talked about a, a, a case in Asia that seems to have been the, where the, the, the key kind of spreader was seated at a at a at a uh, a seat for a long time mm -hmm. um uh if i recall correctly it wasn't a long time it was like maybe two hours yeah yeah, yeah. okay so well, guess, yeah. That, that's a phenomenon that we're familiar with right mm -hmm. um uh is somebody sitting at a, a table in a coffee shop for two hours um while they work or study mm -hmm. um so this seems to be potentially a problematic practice and just limiting the exposure, as you said, may include getting people, not only air cycling through your place, but also people kind of moving through and maybe not staying so long. Yeah, I mean, so right now, when uh, I'm in Yolo County, California, and so when I shot the Phil's Cafe, uh, what struck me is, I mean, they took advantage of their layout and they have one way traffic, made it very easy, no no waiting in line to go pick up your you know pre-order. Um, you just walk in, grab it and walk out. Um, so that's that's really I think the as best you can do in terms of limiting your exposure. Um, I should say that this the Starbucks outbreak in in Seoul, Korea, um, it was the air conditioning circulated around, um, but what really mattered was they didn't have apparently they didn't have adequate ventilation. So if they had the air conditioner, you know, blowing stuff around, and if they had opened the windows, and if they had done something else to increase the ventilation, presumably less people would have gotten infected because those particles carrying the virus would have gotten sucked out by the ventilation or, or blown out the window or somewhere else. So again, it's like basically, uh, you know, uh, hopefully it doesn't gross people too, out too much, but like there in that case, there was this example of stirring the pee in the bathtub, you know, that right. doesn't that doesn't do anything. You gotta do something else to get rid of the pee. Right. Okay. So um, uh, there's, a, there's a few questions here about, that have to do with, well, there was one question about um, in office spaces, coffee uh, in office spaces, ah. and, it, and it's um, uh, is the main concern about congregation, um, or are there other uh, people? Or are there other concerns to take into consideration here? So I'm not sure if the question is about the, if the coffee is affecting the situation. I mean, uh, no, 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 no. it's just it, I think it's talking about in offices. Yeah. There's often a coffee station. Is yeah. the big concern that people will come together and sort of gather there, or but it sounds like what you're saying is the bigger concern is the overall air environment yeah. in the office. Let me let me show. Whoops, whoops. Oh wait, um, are you guys still there? Can, can you see this? Yeah, um, I can see it. Um, I don't have it open. Let me open it. Um, I'm going to show. I'm going to pull up one um, uh, uh, image that I think uh, really goes towards that. Um, okay. But, sorry, it's not open yet. Um, here we go. Okay. Can you guys see this? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and so, um, oh, but I lost you, Peter. Okay. Well, anyway, oh, there you are. Okay. So here, this is, here's an office city. This is a, a call center. It happens again to be Korea because they have really good contact tracing there. 
there's a, a skyscraper at the level of the floor and it's a call center so there's all these employees sitting here you know making phone calls all day long and uh blue is somebody who got infected white is somebody who did not and you know i think they have a coffee station here somewhere i forget where it, oh yeah here it is uh i think actually i'm not sure um but uh the key point here even without a coffee station <laughs> even without a dedicated kitchen or somewhere where people are making coffee or congregating here it was crowded and it was just the air mixing through that the whole space so this uh, this is another case in point for the idea of airborne kind of longer range airborne transmission because look it's fairly random who got infected versus who didn't if it really required direct exposure you might imagine that, like it all be tightly clustered in one corner you know uh, but it's not it's throughout the whole the whole building right or the whole floor so having said all that i guess i guess the concern is like okay there's a coffee pot over in the corner of the office you know does that pull people together um it's um it's it's, it's possible it, it depends on the the ventilation there locally um, my first thought is that like, oh, that's like swimming over to one corner of the bathtub, um, you know, and saying, okay, it's more dangerous over here. Well, is it, if the air is well mixed in there and poorly ventilated, then it probably doesn't matter whether you're standing over here or over here, um, you, you haven't really limited your exposure. Now, having said that, I mean, if you do have uh, points in your office, we are talking a lot here about aerosol transmission. There is still the possibility of somebody coughing in your face, you know, so, if, or talking in your face, um, you know, I showed those videos of, when you're having a face-to-face -face conversation, the air coming out of your respiratory tract is potentially being inhaled directly by your conversational partner into their respiratory tract and carrying particles and infecting them. Um, and so if the coffee pot is serving as a place that helps increase the odds of maskless face-to-face -face conversations, then it would be bad. And there's nothing special about coffee there. It could be anything. It could be the, the water cooler or the, I don't know, the snack bar or, or whatever, you know, um, anything that does it. So again, you want to wear the masks inside um, and increase the ventilation, limit your exposure. Yeah. Okay, so there's a number of questions now moving from, from that into um, sort of, let's say, physical contact, you know, so there's a number of questions about baristas preparing drinks, um, condiment stations that have people pouring cream and sugar and stuff like that and touching things. Um, uh, is what's the level of cons your, your conversation has been mostly about air transmission what about what about you know physical contact um transmission so yeah that's really tough right and so everybody i'm sure is very keenly aware that early on everybody's saying wash your hands wash your hands is all you know hand contact um now if you go look at the cdc webpage, it's it's talking about um uh, person to person um exposure and, uh, by droplets and by that they mean coughing in your face um it's on talking about the longer range uh, airborne transmission, you know, via these aerosol particles. They also still mention the possibility of uh, direct contact or what's known as fomites, you know. So the concern, and I'm not saying this is what happens, but the concern is that like, you know, uh, an infected person touches the creamer or the creamer container in the cafe, then walks away. Um, and then somebody else comes along, touches the creamer container, and now it's on their hand. It's believed right now that that's uh, not the main, not the main mode of transmission, okay? If it, uh, it, there's so much evidence now that it's really much more through the air, either face-to-face, -face, you know, within six feet or longer range airborne transmission. Having said that, um, just because it's the main doesn't mean it's the only, right? And so uh, one should still take precautions to clean surfaces, um, should limit, you know, uh, shared things um, like like the creamer container, or at least any any type of surface that is touched on a very regular basis it should be cleaned on a regular basis too um, because even if the odds are smaller that you can get infected by uh, a fomite transmission uh, it's not zero and it's you know I, and this for good cleanliness if you're operating a cafe uh, environment you should be cleaning all the stuff on a regular basis anyways I mean so that, that's not a huge lift hopefully um, but at the same time I wouldn't be you shouldn't be paranoid I mean, some people are even now months into it still you know, sanitizing their, their plastic grocery bags from, from the grocery store and things like that. There's like zero evidence in the literature that like you need to do that. Um, so you don't need to be paranoid and scrub everything, you know, uh, religiously. That's not uh, called for. I mean, th so that's why I focus on here. I think what's very insidious and people don't realize is that, you know, uh, you could have very poor ventilation and that's what's driving the transmission. It happened to this, uh, apparently happened to the Starbucks in Korea, right? Um, 
and it's happened to a whole bunch of places. So, oh, and I guess another, sorry, just another point of evidence uh, for that was that, uh, that Guangzhou restaurant. Again, they have video evidence. This person here did not talk to, the infected person did not talk to or touch or anything with this, uh, some of these other infected people, right? There are different parties at different tables, but they got infected, right? So how did that happen? It wasn't because they all touched the same fork, right? So. Yeah, on that, and on that um, note, there's there's been a question or two about about cupping early on. Um, one of the one of the changes, sort of, that we were as we were struggling to figure out how to cope. Um, you know, we we have these public cupping things where people gather to taste coffee together, and one yes. of our earliest changes that that we made as an organization was say, okay, well, wait, we're going to modify that process. And um, have it be that people aren't sharing, you know, cups because of the um, risk of saliva transmission and stuff. And over time, what we realized is the problem was not sharing the cup. The problem is sharing the room. Yeah. yeah. And and um, and so I think you know there have been some questions already about about okay, what's the what's the deal there? I think and I think to me that's the message is the shared cupping. Um, uh, the sharing the spoons in the bowls might be a concern about other diseases besides COVID too, um, but the bigger concern right now in terms of COVID is the room that the cupping is hand, hand is uh, is happening in and gathering to do anything together, whether it's a meal or a cupping, is increasing your risk. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, the virus is unlikely to survive in almost boiling water um, or in a hot surface, and so when you dip the spoon in. Even if the spoon is contaminated, it's not unlikely to survive that. Um, I would worry more about the rinse cup. Usually, there's like a little glass of, you know, not super hot water. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I think at least for COVID-19, if I uh, if I was cupping in an indoor poorly ventilated, if I was doing anything in an indoor poorly ventilated room, I would I would nope out backwards. I mean, that, that's just not a a good idea at all. Um, but I wouldn't worry like crazy about the spoon or the uh, cup. It's much more about the air. Yeah, and there's actually a very specific question here. Um, I'll, I'll read it because it's uh, it's an interesting example of of what people are doing. Um, we'll, we've reopened for uh, window service only, one barista working at a time with no overlap, contactless sales, both baristas and customers wearing masks at all times. We are in no disposable cafe, and we've set up a transfer system where we make drinks in a sanitized in sanitized transfer cups at the bar, and then transfer the drink into the customer cup that they leave outside on the window ledge. After we transfer the drink, we place the transfer cup in a sanitizer bath. Is this system safe enough for both customers and staff? We feel very safe, although sometimes I wonder if it's a little over the top. Thank you for taking the time and making the video, et cetera. That sounds like it's a good example of sterile technique. Uh, you know, microbiologists go to extreme lengths to make sure that there's no bacteria on any surface. And so that's that seems uh, pretty extreme. If I understand that like they're pouring something into a a customer supplied cup and then taking the thing that they poured into the customer supplied cup and then sanitizing that right away um i mean yeah yes it's, i mean it's safe i guess the question would be like oh gosh do we have to re-sanitize the thing we poured out of every single time um and like i said i mean there's no evidence that COVID 19 in particular is spreading primarily by pouring hot beverages or, or cold beverages or whatever um out of a container into somebody else's container um you know, it, I'd be more worried about being in close proximity. If you're like you're face to face while you're pouring it, I'd be much more worried about what's coming out of their their mouth or my mouth um, in terms of a transmission risk for that. Here's a here's a sort of more general question, and um um is it is uh, typically what kind of particles in a food service environment does COVID nineteen like traveling on? So uh, right now the consensus is that it's spread on respiratory droplets which if they're small enough they kind of evaporate down into these uh so-called droplet nuclei they, they turn into like kind of dried residual um proteins and salts and potentially virus particles um and so that's like so that and that that's true whether you're in a cafe or in a restaurant or an office or wherever you know your, your living room um more speculatively it's possible that the virus can also travel on other micron scale aerosol particles. I'm, I'm probably, I'm part of a very small community of people who might even mention that as a possibility uh, because my colleagues and I have done some research on that and we showed that 
um, influenza virus can be transported on, you know, uh, dust on on cellulosic uh, fiber particles in the micron scale range. Again, too small to see, but they can be carried around. And so, um, you know, I think I showed a video in the uh, in the YouTube video of rubbing a Kleenex, and this it's a good example of how counterintuitive things are because to to us to you know, to our naked eye, it looks like nothing's happening. You're just, okay, you're sitting there rubbing a Kleenex. At the microscopic scale, tremendous things are happening. There's a huge cloud of micron scale particles being emitted. And if they happen to be carrying virus, then those can be infectious. So that was a long way away of saying like, it's there's so much evidence pointing to respiratory, direct respiratory emissions that I think that's the main concern, the consensus for COVID-19. That doesn't mean that there might not be other types of particles. Um, what I would advocate very strongly is if you're job is to wipe the counters and to sweep the floor and uh, you know wipe off the tables and all this stuff you know all those activities aerosolize dust particles and so i strongly strongly urge you or your employees or whoever to wear a mask when you're cleaning even if you're the only person there like there's nobody there like you might be uh, it's called re-aerosolizing or resuspending uh contaminated dust particles um that might uh um, or dried mucus particles. You, you imagine, imagine a customer came in and did sneeze on your table, right? Um, if they were sitting on the table and sneeze on it, then walk away, might dry. Later on, you come along, wipe it up. As part of the process of wiping up, you knock some of the stuff in the air and then you breathe it in. That's that's I would uh, say a potential concern. So wear a mask. Same with uh, changing the air filters, right? Um, you know that yeah, uh, concentrating. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And like there's there's people who've thought about indoor air for a while. Who've, always recommended that based on very little data. And so, but now we're starting to get data showing that, you know, dust can't carry it. So yeah, I feel like you're changing, um, you know, uh, one of your MERV 13 filters that you've installed, um, you know, uh, make sure you wear a mask. I, I recommend when I, I have one of these, I'm in my office right now. I have one of these things, um, you know, here's an air purifier. Um, I have some at home too. We've had all this wildfire smoke. Uh, it does a great job getting the smoke particulars out of there. When I, uh, when I clean them, I open it up and I take it outside, so I vacuum it outside because I feel it doesn't make sense to open it up and then start knocking all the dust into the air inside, right? Uh, so I take it outside, uh, vacuum it, it, takes like two minutes, then put it back in. So yes, wear a mask. And if you can, with your portable air fil filter, do it outside. And that was one of the, for me, one of the big insights of this work is that how powerful, in this sense, uh, an air filter, like one of these small $100 air filtration units can be you mentioned the idea of putting one of those sort of behind the bar in an inconspicuous place um, that sort of, you know, may help to uh, protect the um, the baristas as they're working, um, uh, things like that. I'm imagining as we start to move towards things like um, larger gatherings that are happening in places and we're still concerned about transmission, I can expect, I can anticipate a lot of, a lot more people using these portable air filtration devices to just sort of trying to clean up their air in their immediate vicinity a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, some people listening here might have seen the vice presidential debate here in the States. Um, and if you paid attention to that, um, they put up two plexiglass barriers on either side of either candidate. They're, they're already 12 feet apart. They put up little plexiglass slides. And some of my colleagues uh, in the aerosol science community uh, laughed out loud when we saw that because it basically doesn't do anything. It's uh, in terms of preventing aerosol transmission. Just to reiterate that point, um, you know, if one of the candidates had started smoking even 12 feet away, that barrier, the plastic sheet, wouldn't have done anything to prevent the smoke from traveling over there. And so, to your point, Peter, what a lot of people are saying is that what they should have had was some of these things, you know, blowing clean air in each of their faces, um, you know, keep them far apart, and that minimizes the probability of uh, or the chance of droplets traveling that far, the large ones that you can see. But then to really protect them, you need to have some clean air blowing in their face. And so, yes, I, I do think um, it's, I think more and more people start realizing that. And because, as I mentioned in the summary here, the CDC, for whatever reason, been so slow even acknowledging the possibility that these things spread through the air. And that's why there hasn't been much emphasis on ventilation. There hasn't been much emphasis on air purification. I think people will start ramping up uh, in terms of their understanding of that. 
Yeah, there's a, uh, a question from Julia about procedure wiping surfaces with antibacterial sp spray and then leaving it for 30 seconds before wiping off. Is that sufficient? And I think your message is it's great to sanitize surfaces, but the air is 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 really maybe the primary focus here. Yeah, well, I mean, don't forget there's other things too, right? I mean, like everybody here on this call is presumably in the food service industry, right? So there's there's food safety concerns too. I mean, so you definitely, we don't no, like just because COVID is in the headlines right now doesn't mean we should, you know, stop worrying about food safety. So um, yes, you know, definitely you want to wipe down all the surfaces. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, like whether 30 seconds or not is sufficient. Um, uh, it's, um, you know, that that's that depends on the pathogen, depends on what we're talking about. Um, so, and like, yeah. Um, and then there's a question, if ventilation is is very good, do you still need an air filter? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. Um, if you have the luxury of having a um, uh, extremely well-ventilated place already, like so these pictures I showed of the Phil's Cafe, they had great ventilation overhead and the two, two doors wide open, lots and lots of natural ventilation. Uh, I would argue they probably don't need that there. They have so much fresh air. In the back, though, I, I didn't. I didn't go in the back. Um, you know, they could have some office space back there, some storage space, things which might not be. They're not next to the doors. Might not be as naturally ventilated. And if that space is ever shared by more than just one person, then you may want to plug something like that back in there too. So it's really, um, you really need to assess your situation. If you don't, a, a very very simple, very crude rule of thumbs. If you don't feel any airflow. <laughs> Um, then it's, it's probably not adequate. Um, and there's there's literally uh, you know a test where you can take a piece of toilet paper and hold it up in front of a register, you know either a supply or a return register for mechanical ventilation. And if it doesn't move very much, then your airflow is you know way too weak, right? Um, that's how that's the one piece of toilet paper test to see whether you're even getting any ventilation at all. Um, but uh, yeah, but no, if if you already have something that's like extremely well uh, ventilated, so then yeah, there's no point. There's no point in setting up a HEPA air purifier, you know, in a in a doorway, for example, because then you just you're you're purifying the outside air, uh, which you know doesn't help anything. So speaking of outside air, um, could you speak a little more to the the prevalence of transmission in outdoor spaces? Sure. Yeah. I mean, so there was a, a pretty large um, observational study in China, something like seven thousand cases, um, you know, from a, a few months ago. And what they found was that like there was uh, only uh, one out of the 7,000 transmission events um, arguably uh, happened outside. Um, and so, and most of the outbreaks that we've heard about, the, the ones that infect a lot of people that uh, uh, make the news, they've also uh, been indoor, not outdoor events. And so it's believed that there's a couple of reasons why indoor is so much um, uh, more dangerous. Uh, one, uh, and I, I'm sorry, I keep going back to this analogy, but like uh, one is the, the differences in, in ventilation. Outdoors, you effectively have infinite ventilation. You know, a very, very slight breeze just moves everything away, it's gone. Whereas inside, that air is kind of stuck. So again, with apologies for more squeamish people on the call, but like the analogy is kind of like peeing in the ocean versus peeing in a bathtub, right? In the ocean, this is gone. In the bathtub, you're, you're heavily contaminated, right? Um, and so, that's that's one reason. The second reason is that um, at least during daytime, uh, the UV from the sun apparently uh, helps degrade and kill the virus, the SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so there's something called the half-life, which you might have heard that phrase in terms of you know radioactive decay and things like that. But uh, uh, microbiologists also use half-life to describe how long it takes for half of the pathogens to die. And so in indoor environments that are not, you know, not directly exposed to UV from the sun, that half-life is several hours. Hours, okay. So the virus persists for a very long time, up up to up to more than 24 hours in some observations. In direct sunlight, it's six minutes. So the the virus is very weak. It, like just a little bit of sunlight kills it um, uh, pretty quickly. Um, and so that's the second thing. So if you're outside, it's much safer because like not only is it getting blown away, but it's also getting zapped by the sun. Um, Whereas neither of those are true indoors. You could have it accumulate due to lack of ventilation and there's nothing killing it very quickly in terms of the um, solar radiation. So hopefully that answers that question. That's that's why that's why everybody's saying outdoors safer than indoors. Right, okay. Um, 
there's uh, one more question. I feel like we're, we're touching on some of the th same things here is there's a question about disinfectants and, um, you know, well, I'll read it. Do I, do I need any type of special disinfectant since now we have indoor seating? This is in South Carolina where they've opened up back up for indoor seating. Now all the restaurants are, are seating indoors again. Um, is there a special disinfectant that can help? Um, everyone before thought Lysol and regular known cleaners weren't sufficient. Um, is there really a safe way to have uh, uh, indoor seating? Like air filters, you know, per how many square feet or something? And I think you've said that the key here is the air changes per hour, and and which is something that, you know, normal people like us don't necessarily know. I don't think about. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I've heard the question that said something. The claim was that Lysol doesn't work. Um, I, I'm not familiar with that claim. I haven't heard that. Lysol is pretty harsh. I would imagine that would break down um, any viral coating. Um, but uh, uh, if there's reports of the contrary, I'd be, I'd be uh, glad to see them. Um, yeah, no, I think the, towards the second point of your question, yeah, it's it's much more about the air change per hour. And if you're getting an air purifier, there's something called the clean air delivery rate. I mean, so this this one that I've held up here a couple times on full blast it does 135 cubic feet per minute. Okay, and so is that a lot or is that a little? Well, it depends on how big your space is. Um, you need to calculate how many cubic feet your entire space is. You need to know already um, if you really want to get in the weeds, you want, want to know how many air changes per hour, how many cubic feet per minute your mechanical ventilation is delivering, whether or not you have any natural ventilation. Um, and then you can assess whether, uh, you know, one air purifier in the back corner is gonna be enough or it's gonna be a, a drop in the bucket. It really depends on your space. And because most people, I think on this call, have uh, no training on HVAC or assessment or anything, that's why it's it's good if you're the boss or the manager, find somebody to do an HVAC assessment. If you're the barista, the employee, bug your manager to do that. Um, you know. Because if they don't care about that, that you know, that's that's not good. Yeah. Do you speaking of HVAC technicians? I imagine that there is some sort of spectrum about expertise, even among the HVAC community, sure. um, in terms of of measuring and stuff. Do you, are you aware of any like particular? I don't. I'm I'm imagining a certification or something, or some sort of oh, clue yeah. word that. Uh, I'm blanking on the acronym right now. That like yeah, there's there's different. ASHRAE is kind of the professional organization, but then mm -hmm. there's like the there, is, there are different professional organizations, like there's one for uh, environmental refrigeration and something, I forget, the, I'm sorry, I forget the exact acronym, um, but I'm not even sure that they're, you know, uh, uh, how widespread they are uh, nationally or, or what the equivalent ones are overseas. Um, so that's, I mean, somebody in your local community will know who the go-to HVAC guys are. I mean, so- It's that's worth spending some time to get educated on that. Yeah, Yeah. I think. One of the things, you, one of the resources you made me aware of through your video and through your work is the um, the Harvard uh, Public School of Health Schools for Health right. program. Yeah, Joseph um, Allen. Joseph Allen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and on there, there's lots of resources, including resources for HVAC people. Yeah. Um, uh, very technical guides to measuring air changes per hour um, that are beyond my understanding, but would be, you know, you could provide to a to a uh, uh, somebody. So I'd recommend that if people are interested in reading further. We're going to be publishing more stuff that's specific, working with Bill, that's specific to the coffee community, but um, that's another source of information that they're talking about schools, but in many cases it's the same thing. Or it might be a coffee school. I mean, many people in our community are, are involved in coffee education and basically run classrooms, you know? So that's a really good resource, I think, for them um, talking about the context of people sitting in desks for some amount of time and how do you keep that space um, safe? Yeah, no, I, I strongly endorse uh, Joe Allen's uh, 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 SMART uh, program, S-M-A-R-T, you know, for the schools. Mm -hmm. He also wrote a book called Healthy Buildings, um, which is aimed at kind of businessy types. So if you're more on the managerial side on this call, I recommend you go pick that up. Lots oh, of fascinating great. stuff uh, talking about, you know, how indoor air quality not just for disease transmission, but just indoor air quality in general, really affects productivity um, and propensity to purchase uh, by your uh, customers too, right? If you have stale, you know, very high CO2 laden air, that's not good for anybody. So it's worth worth thinking about. It. And it's like really just gone under the radar for most people. Yeah, okay, that's very interesting. Well, Bill, um, this has been um, really 
interesting and valuable, and we're grateful to your work on this. Thank um, you. And everybody uh, here, thank you for all your questions. Um, please continue to spread the word. Um, you know, Pacific Foods um, contribution has allowed us to make this freely available to anyone. So I know a lot of people are sending the videos to their friends and colleagues and 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 stuff. And and so that's our goal here is to make the entire community um, safer and give them the tools to to make them safe. So so I'm grateful again to uh, Pacific um, for their um, for their support here. I'm grateful, Bill, to you for all the time and effort that you've uh, that you've put into this. Um, and with that, we'll close for today. Um, I remain uh, Peter Giuliano um, of the Specialty Coffee Association, thanking Professor um, Bill Ristenpart of UC Davis and the UC Davis Coffee Center. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Thanks for this opportunity.